instance, the ordeal of cold water mm-hmm. was where they would take someone who was accused of a crime mm-hmm. and they would tie their hands and feet together and they would throw them in a the lake. If they floated, they were guilty because the water had rejected them. The pure water had tossed them out. If they sank, they were not guilty. They might drown, but they're not guilty if they sank. Hi, everybody. I'm here today with Clay Conrad, who is an attorney in Texas and an expert on the topic of jury nullification. I have in front of me here his book, Jury Nullification, The Evolution of a Doctrine. Uh, It's quite good. I'm about a third of the way through it, and uh, it is really a seminal work on this topic. How are you doing tonight, Clay? Oh, I'm fine. I'm glad to hear that. So uh, can you tell us uh, just a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm... A lawyer here in Houston, Texas. Uh, the, the firm name is Looney and Conrad, and uh, I got into this topic after meeting Larry Dodge, one of the founders of FIJA in New York in the uh, late '80s. And um, after I started law school in '93, I started researching it seriously, and it eventually became a, a book that came out in '98. It's going to be reissued by the Cato Institute uh, in hardcover this fall. Oh, excellent. So what what is it about this issue in particular? What was the one thing where you said to yourself, I really need to, to, to get a hold of this issue, I really need to understand it, and, and I think I might even write a, a book about it? Well, two things, which is like a lot of people, when I first encountered the issue, Uh, I didn't necessarily accept it. Mm -hmm. Uh, It took me a while to to start reading on it and discovering more about it. But I also noticed that there were a lot of things written by these, for lack of a better word, um, people who were in these sort of underground, quote-unquote, patriot groups or militia groups, and they were spreading a lot of misinformation. Mm-hmm. A lot of the a lot of the stuff that they were out there publishing just simply wasn't true, and that's dangerous on many levels. One of them is that it it uh, can get people in trouble when they depend on bad information, mm-hmm. and on the other hand, it casts a really bad light over the people who are legitimately working on the issue. Mm -hmm. If you've got people out there who think they're in favor of something and they are saying things that aren't true, then when the people who, who are serious come along, everyone goes, oh yeah, I know what you're all about. And they expect the same sort of of garbage to be thrown at them. So one of the things I did when I started in law school, I had access to pretty much unlimited legal research Mm -hmm. sources. And I started, for Larry Dodge and the people in Fiji, I started going through all of these sources, a lot of which they were publishing, to discover which ones were valid and which ones weren't. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, somewhere you've got to be able to either find the citation in the book it supposedly came from or quit using it. Mm -hmm. Uh, We found there was one quote from uh, former Justice Harlan Stone that was bandied about a lot, and I still see it on the Internet every once in a while. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a quote that he wrote. It was a quote from an article he wrote where he was stating the side of the issue he disagreed with. Mm -hmm. Yes, he said those, he wrote those words, but he wrote those words to say, this is what the people I disagree with say. And so trying to use that as a legitimate quote 
is disgraceful. It's dishonest. Right. Um, and it, it could be that someone who is just uh, doing a, a search on the Internet and came across this one quote and never bothered to read the article. Mm-hmm. Or it could be that someone was just dishonest and wanted to feel like they made a big point. But it's really important to be intellectually honest when you're fighting for ideas. Otherwise, nobody is going to want to listen to you. Right. And, and this is a fight where it's been so easy to tune out um, the pro-jury side of things. Uh, in part because so many people were peddling crap. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I kind of made it my job to go through and decide which was valid and, and which was invalid uh, to the best of my ability using, you know, the University of Texas School of Law, where I went to law school, has uh, one of the best legal libraries in the country and of course as a as a law student you also get unlimited lexus and westlaw access Mm -hmm. so there there's very little i didn't have the ability to put my finger on if uh, if i needed to find it that's excellent so for those of our of the people are listening here um, who, you know, they don't, maybe they don't know what jury nullification is. Maybe they even have a wrong idea about what it is. Can you sum it up for us? What exactly is the concept of jury nullification? It is the doctrine that a criminal trial juror can refuse to convict on conscientious grounds if they believe the law is unjust, the law is being unjustly applied, um, or the defendant has already suffered enough. Mm -hmm. Um, It is a one-way doctrine. It it doesn't go to the prerogative of juries to convict uh, in in the teeth of law and fact. And the reason it doesn't do that is because a judge can come in and grant a directed verdict or a a judgment notwithstanding the verdict if someone is convicted and the facts don't support it. Mm -hmm. But uh, the judge cannot intervene if the jury finds someone not guilty. Once someone is found not guilty, that's over. Mm -hmm. They are done. So So, um, the people... Well, let, let first, let's see. Where, do, where does it come from? Does it come from the Constitution? Does it predate the Constitution? What, where do, what's, what's, give us a little bit of the history behind it, please. Well, it certainly predates the, the Constitution by centuries. Um, mm-hmm. and, and the history is extensive. Uh, one factor in there was that back in the... Uh, back in the British history, you had judges who were basically riding around the country holding uh, court in different villages. And these judges didn't want to be held personally responsible for the verdicts because they didn't want to be you know, attacked on the road on the way to the next village by the people <laughs> who didn't like the way the courts came out. Uh And so the jury was the one, that's part of the reason why the jury was so important in early, uh, early Anglo American law was that it was, uh, it was a step between the, uh, judge and the public. It was the jury's responsibility to come up with the verdict. Um, Now, English juries would refuse to convict in all sorts of cases where the law would have supported a conviction uh, because back then there were over 200 offenses that were punishable by death. Mm. And juries would say, hmm, you know, Joe shouldn't have stolen that ring, but he's a good old boy. We don't want to see him hung. So they'd find him not guilty. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was 
pretty widely accepted that juries could do that. The only time it really became controversial was in political cases. Mm-hmm. Things like uh, the leveler cases, John Wilburn, and the cases of uh, William Penn and William Meade, and cases where the government itself had a stake in the outcome. You know, the government really doesn't care if one more murderer gets off or not, but you let a revolutionary go, and or someone who is uh, printing uh, pamphlets that are critical of the government, and then the government has a real concern. <laughs> and in those cases, um, jury nullification became a kind of a big deal and led to what uh, what has been called the heroic age of the English trial jury. Mm-hmm. Now you come across to America, and of course, one of the big jury nullification cases uh, from the uh, 17th century, from 1670, was the acquittal of William Penn and William Meade. So obviously, Pennsylvania, you've got a, a foothold with jury nullification already. Mm-hmm. And in in America, you have cases like the John Peter Zenger case, which is probably the most famous one, mm-hmm. where uh, Zenger was accused of libeling the royally appointed governor of New York. And in spite of admitting all the facts, the jury acquitted him mm-hmm. on a basis that was not supported by the law. Um, and they were... Uh, you know, that was a very celebrated verdict, and it was the most famous case in colonial America. And then, similar to England, you had um, capital punishment for theft cases and the like. And juries across the country would refuse to convict in cases like that, mm-hmm. uh, where they thought that the punishment far exceeded the value of the crime. Mm-hmm. So it's... It, in the Constitution, jury nullification is not specifically mentioned, but it is protected by the Double Jeopardy Clause, because once someone's been acquitted, it's over, regardless of the grounds for the acquittal. Mm-hmm. And the founders certainly were aware that juries could do this. And in the book, I argue, and I think with, with some basis, that when the Sixth Amendment guarantees the right of trial by jury that it includes a jury with the power to nullify Mm -hmm. because that was the jury the founders knew that had to be what they intended to pass on Mm -hmm. was was a jury in the form that they knew it and they knew the jury to have those powers they recognized the jury to have those powers Mm -hmm. so it, it makes no sense to think that they meant a more constrained version of the jury to be passed on to their progeny. Right. So before there were jury trials... I don't know if I rambled too much there. <laughs> not at all, not at all. This is all very fascinating, Clay. But, but before there were jury trials, how were verdicts rendered? Well, now you're really getting back there in, in terms of <laughs> in terms of time. You're talking about, for the most part, before the 12th century... Uh-huh. And there you had uh, all sorts of essentially mystical forms of trial. Uh, the trial of ordeal, the trial by cold water, the trial of the cursed morsel. And these were all things that essentially ba- were based on religion. For instance, the ordeal of cold water mm-hmm. was where they would take someone who was accused of a crime Mm-hmm. And they would tie their hands and feet together, and they would throw them in a lake. If they floated, they were guilty, because the water had rejected them. The pure water had tossed them out. If they sank, they were not guilty. Oh they might God. drown, but they're not guilty if they sank. Oh, my God. Uh, <sighs> another, uh, another one was the ordeal of hot water where they would take a pot of boiling water and say throw a 
cold ring on the bottom of it, and you were supposed to reach in there with your bare hand and pull the ring out. Mm -hmm. Um, Then they would bandage your hand up, and if it became infected, you were guilty. If your hand healed normally, then you were not guilty. That one sounds slightly or if you fair. Didn't burn. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it, the trial is its own punishment, you could say. And then there's the uh, trial by battle, where you would fight your accuser, <laughs> and you know, you know, might right makes might, and whoever, if you were innocent, you'd win. If you were guilty, they'd win. Um, wow. And there were the trial, the trial by cursed morsel is one of my favorite, where they'd take like a small piece of bread or something, Mm -hmm. and the priest would pray over it, and then you'd eat it. And if you were guilty, you were expected to choke. Hmm. And people did choke, although it's never been proven one way or the other, but there are historians who suspect that's because the bread was poisoned. (laughs) Uh. (laughs) So... Um, it's crazy. A lot of uh, a lot of interesting ordeals, and, and mostly they're religiously based. That you know, if you are if you are good and pure, you will survive, and if you are guilty, you will be condemned. But what happened around uh, the time of the Magna Carta is that the Church withdrew its approval of the ordeals, mm. and at the same time, trial by jury became the norm. And it's all, you know, uh, like any, anything from 800 years ago, there are numerous factors, but those were two of the big ones that led to uh, trial by jury Mm -hmm. Um, becoming the norm was, was the Magna Carta and the, the withdrawal of the church's imprimatur to the ordeals. That is really interesting. So... So we had, so from the Magna Carta on, even past the American Revolution, we had, you know, jury trials and jury nullification was officially, or, you know, just, it was recognized, was generally recognized. But when did it end? When when did things start to go south? And why today? Well, it never, it never ended. Mm -hmm. Juries still have the prerogative to refuse to convict on conscientious grounds. Mm -hmm. So it never ended. But what did happen was around the end of the 19th century. Um, Legal formalism came in. Uh, The legal academy became very prominent, the law schools, and they wanted law taught as a science. Mm -hmm. And And with the science, they want it to be very formal, very, it has to follow that if A and B, then C. Um, I see. And also, you had a lot of uh, industrial concerns that were trying to put down unions at the time. Hmm. Uh, So there was really, between legal formalism and the need for the powers that be to keep the people from having too much of an influence, uh, the jury started to become more and more marginalized. Mm-hmm. As a result, you had the Supreme Court in 1895 deciding that um, a jury didn't have to be told of its powers to uh, refuse to convict in a murder case or of its powers to convict on a lesser offense. Mm-hmm. So, so once juries weren't um, informed anymore, or, or there, there wasn't an obligation to inform them, did, did jury nullification or the, the knowledge of it, did it slowly decline? Did it slowly fall out of the culture, or was it a rapid thing? Mm, it, it was generational. It was over many generations. For instance, even after that, uh, prohibition uh, was the victim of huge quantities of jury nullification. Uh, in some parts of the country, as many as 60% of prohibition trials ended in not guilty verdicts, and that's got to be the result of juries refusing to convict. It can't be that the prosecutors became that sloppy. 
<laughs> and and uh, it's important to remember that under prohibition, only production and distribution were illegal. It was not illegal to um, possess wine or liquor or beer. It was only illegal to produce it, smuggle it into the country, distribute it, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for instance, right now, if, if the war on drugs didn't penalize mere possession, uh, we'd probably have like 5% of the cases filed that we have. Mm-hmm. Um, so we it's the people who were what we would now probably be calling drug kingpins in the press that were getting acquitted 60% of the time Mm -hmm. uh, during the period of prohibition. So juries still had their, people still had this knowledge that juries could do this. It took decades of not talking about it for people to forget about it. And I think that's really what's happened, is nobody was talking about it. After Sparf and Hansen, nobody talked about it in court. Mm-hmm. Um, and nobody, it, it wasn't in the press, it wasn't a big issue, it wasn't the subject of any publicity, the way it was during the Fugitive Slave Act days. During At that time, there were pamphlets being produced uh, oh, really? discussing jury nullification, yeah. Hmm. But that isn't happen- That wasn't happening in the 20th century. Mm-hmm. To some extent, you did see some jury nullification around Vietnam War protester trials. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it got to the point where it became more and more rare as the 20th century wore on. Hmm. And I think it's just a, a matter of you know, if you don't have any publicity on it, if nobody's talking about it, if you don't have any education going on, it just fades into history. Nobody remembers it anymore. Right. What, uh, you know, today there are uh, some people who don't like the concept of jury nullification. What do these critics say? What are their most uh, repeated or most perhaps effective arguments against it today? The one you hear most is uh, blaming the juries for the acquittals in civil rights, murder, and lynching trials. Mm -hmm. Um, And that has a lot of superficial appeal. It sounds right. But when you look at the federal cases in the same jurisdictions, you see convictions. So you see different prosecutors, different judges, different investigators, and you see convictions. Then in the state cases, you see acquittals, even though you've got the same jury pool. Hmm. Um, And so when you look at those cases, very often what you see is a show trial that's put on to appease the northern media without any real effort to get a conviction. Uh, And you see case after case like that to the point where it can't be mere coincidence anymore. And then the feds come in with their violation of civil rights prosecutions and get convictions Mm -hmm. um, because they have an honest investigation and they have prosecutors who are trying to get a conviction instead of just placate the northern press. Mm-hmm. So really it was the state, uh, the, was the prosecution the other, that was the dropping issues, the ball there. Is that what you're saying? Pardon? So really it was the prosecution <laughs> that was dropping the ball in those cases. Is that what you're saying? The prosecution, the judge, uh, the cops, uh-huh. in the in the Byron Della Beckwith trial for the murder of Menger Evers, for instance, there were uniformed police officers who got up and testified that they saw Menger Evers putting gas in his car 200 miles away from there at the time that 
uh, Megar Evers was, in their words, getting himself killed. Hmm. So when you've got testimony like that, is it any wonder that the jury didn't convict? I mean, as a criminal defense lawyer, if I had uniformed cops testifying that the defendant was nowhere near there, I would expect a conviction. <laughs> um, you know, you, it's, it's not even controversial that if you've got uniformed police officers testifying your client wasn't there, he's probably not going to get convicted. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but then again, then they turn around and they scapegoated the jury for uh, actions that the officials in the system took. And that's really easy to do because once the jury disbands, they're not there to defend themselves anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, there, once the jury renders its verdict, there is no jury anymore. <laughs> so you can't go and, you know, they do not have a press agent. Uh, they're not holding, right. They're not holding, uh, you know, press interviews the way the district attorney's office will. Right. That makes complete sense. So, um, you, you are a criminal defense attorney, right? Yes, that's what I do. So how, how have you handled, so you're, you're basically barred from, from talking about this in court, is that right? Mm-hmm. So yes, we, we're not allowed to, to bring it up directly. So how um, have you handled this? Well, it's important to make sure that the jury has reasons to want to find the defendant not guilty. Mm-hmm. Um, it's important that they know that in the final analysis, it's their verdict and that what they do is up to them. Mm -hmm. And that's really, a lot of times that's all you need to do is make sure they know that they can and make sure that they want to. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, people tend to interpret the facts in a way that makes sense to them. Mm -hmm. And if what makes sense to you is not that Joe is guilty, the chance that you will find Joe not guilty is much better. And that's, it's sort of subliminal jury nullification a lot of the times where people come to the verdict that they believe is right. Uh, and maybe they don't even know why, but they just go into the jury room with a very strong feeling that this guy is not guilty. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they, uh, people will very often come to the right decision and then they will, look at the facts and look at the evidence and, and interpret it in a way that makes sense to them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, if what makes sense to them is not guilty, then they will find the defendant not guilty a lot of the times, not all the time, mm -hmm. but sometimes, uh, sometimes it's enough. A lot of times you give the jury it, the legal arguments and reasons why they should acquit. And then maybe the jury gives those more weight than they otherwise would have, because that's the verdict they want to come to. A lot of times you never know if the jury nullified or not. Mm -hmm. You just know that they came to the right verdict, mm -hmm. uh, but you don't really know why. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's part of the, difficulty in researching this issue is that you don't really know a lot of the times why the jury came to the decision it did come to. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's a challenge. So uh, to those of us who are activists, who are interested in uh, spreading the word, educating the public, 
having an impact on this issue. What what advice what advice do you have for us? You know, what do you think is the best way for us to go about this uh, this this project of of reviving awareness of jury nullification? Patiently. <laughs> what I mean by that is that this is a power of the jury, a prerogative of the jury that has been minimized over generations. It's not going to be restored overnight. Mm -hmm. It's going to take some time and some work. The best way in my mind to do that is high school kids, junior high kids should learn about this in school, ideally. Mm -hmm. They should learn, they should be prepared by the time they leave high school to act as empowered jurors. It's the only way in my mind to return the importance of the jury uh, to the center of the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. We have seen over the last 50 years, especially, the number of jury trials in America actually get reduced. We're having fewer jury trials now than we did 50 years ago. Really? We're having more cases settle, uh, both criminal and civil. Um, the reduction in jury trials is probably more profound on the civil side uh, and more profound on the federal side than in the state side. Mm -hmm. But in all areas, we're seeing the number of jury trials go down instead of up. And we're having more cases filed, fewer of them go to juries. Mm -hmm. The reason, I think, is very, part, very largely because people don't understand why the jury is important. Mm -hmm. If you don't understand why an institution is important, you're not going to fight to preserve it. You're not going to want to participate in it. Mm -hmm. You're not going to have confidence in it. Um, and because people don't understand why the jury is an important part of the American criminal justice system and the American legal system, criminal and civil, people are not showing up for jury duty. They're not electing to have a jury trial if they're involved in a civil or criminal case. Mm -hmm. And the institution is being gradually done away with. Um, and, and that is, that is a tragedy because it is such an important part of what the American criminal justice system was designed to be. Hmm. Um, we're, just, we're just losing it, and we're turning into administrative courts where it's not about what's right or what's just or what the law requires. It's just about let's make a deal. Mm-hmm. Well, um, we had a we had a case we had a case that uh, in Brownsville, Texas, just two weeks ago, that ended in a not guilty verdict. Uh, we were the second lawyer on the case. The first lawyer the defendant hired mm -hmm. was just trying to make a deal, and the defendant was like, "But I'm not guilty. Mm -hmm. I want a jury trial." And his lawyer was like, "Yeah, but we can keep you out of jail." <laughs> Just sign the air. <laughs> um, because the assumption was you're arrested in the federal courts. You plead. You don't go to a jury trial. Nobody right. goes to a jury trial. Um, when you have assumptions like that, you're not having courts of justice anymore. You're just having administrative courts where the role of the judges is just to make sure that all the paperwork is properly filled out. 
Wow. That, uh, yeah, that's... I don't even know how to react to that. That's... Um, <laughs> So, well, that's, and I think that it, it's such a problem because it reverses the presumption of innocence. If the presumption is that people are going to plead, then you're certainly not presuming that they're innocent. Mm-hmm. So. Well, any, any final words before we uh, wrap up this interview? None that come to mind right now. I can babble on for hours if given a chance. But uh. <laughs> well, uh, it's been a real pleasure spe- speaking with you, Clay. Uh, Clay's book is Jury Nullification: The Evolution of a Doctrine. You can get it at Amazon or at other uh, online retailers. It's a really I think excellent. Cato book. is going to come back out later this year with it. Mm-hmm. Okay, this so this fall sometime. It's, it's supposed to be re-released. Uh huh. It, it, it's an updated uh, edition. Or the no, same text. it's the original edition, but mm-hmm. uh, it's been out of print for a while, and there it, it went through two printings originally, and uh, now it's coming out in a in a third printing this fall via the Cato Institute. That's really excellent. Uh, congratulations on that, and I, I'm enjoying reading it. I, I'm about a, th- a third of the way through, and. Um, it really is. It's required reading, really, for anyone who would like to be uh, active on this topic and have an impact. I think. Well, good luck to you. Okay. Well, thanks again, Clay, and uh, have a great evening. Thank you.